morning, everyone. Um, continu continuous reporting does seem to be uh, a bit of a hot topic, and I can see some very familiar faces from the sessions yesterday and our presenters as well. Um, we're going to look at it from a, a slightly um, oh, particular point of view. So rather than, um, we'll touch on how we've uh, organised continuous reporting in our school, uh, but we're going to go into more depth about the actual assessment themselves and the ideas behind our assessment and how we've used Schoolbox to, I guess, um, pursue a complementary aim, which was to change and uh, improve our actual assessment practices. Um, so a little bit about um, our context to begin with. Um, we adopted Schoolbox at the start of this year. And so this time last year, we were, I think we'd made the decision about this time last year. Um, but we, we, we came to the, the search for an LMS um, with some pretty clear um, objectives already in mind. Um, and developmental uh, rubrics and assessments were definitely something um, that we had in our mind before we uh, uh, found Schoolbox. And one of the big, uh, one of the big decisions or, or reasons why we went for Schoolbox in the end was because um, we found a package that was on the same page as us. And it made us think, you know what, these, this is going to help us achieve um, this goal that we already had before. So we're going to talk a little bit about, um, about what, that, what a de uh, developmental rubric is, uh, why they are important, um, what we're hoping to get out of, uh, out of them, how we went about it, and how we've used Schoolbox to, uh, to facilitate that. Um, we did have a plan to maybe put, do some practical hands-on work today, but I don't know if we'll get there, um, especially with so many people in the room. Um, but definitely questions, in, uh, questions at the end. So we came with a pretty clear question. Um, what is assessment for? What are, we, what are we assessing our kids for? What do we want to get out of our assessments? Um, and if you ask staff that question, teaching staff that question, you're going to get a whole range of answers, I think. And in our experience, that's what happened. Um, and some of those are up on the, up, up on the wall um, uh, at the moment. Um, we found that our... Uh, assessment practices were doing some of these things, uh, some of these things really well, some of these things maybe a little bit, and other things not at all. And it was the things that we weren't doing at all which we really wanted to address. So our assessments, and I assume you know, most assessments in most schools, would be good at putting a grade on a, on a piece of paper, um, maybe even some uh, accountability or ranking students. But what's behind that number? What does that number actually mean? Um, to what extent are our assessment tools or our... Um, our marking schemes actually showing what a student has learned and where they're ready to go next. So the big question for us was really, how do we build assessment practices that show what a student is ready to learn? Um, you know, we talk about summative and formative assessment, and it re we really wanted to change the idea of what summative assessment actually was. So everything becomes formative to a certain extent. Um, as a school, when we were looking for an LMS, we, we were really strong or had a strong um, desire to really shift the conversation around assessment to one of growth uh, and to be able to uh, change student perceptions of what assessment was about. So to get this idea that they were on a, a learning journey, I think was the term that we heard earlier today, um, and to get teachers to think of that as well. So an assessment didn't just mark a, a, a final point, that it became part of a wider progression. So we wanted to be able to track growth and to um, report on growth as well, to change the way we actually report. Uh, and also, again, to use continuous reporting uh, to do that. So just a, a little bit more context, and we will jump around at various points too. I hope it all makes sense in the end. Um, we didn't have continuous reporting until this year. So I guess moving into, uh, in, into Schoolbox, we had a number of things in our mind, and it will become, I guess, a big part of the story about how staff dealt with it all. Uh, we were changing to Schoolbox, we were introducing continuous reporting for the uh, first time, and we were saying we wanted um, uh, a different type of assessment tool to be used along the way. Um, so that was interesting. Okay. There's lots of evidence out there to say that this idea of uh, readiness to learn is uh, a key to improving student outcomes. Uh, and if you if you want to do some reading or you want to take some uh, reading to staff, a nice summary of the research came out I think, probably a couple of years ago now, maybe three. Um, the Grattan Institute produced a report on targeted teaching. So I haven't put it up there, but um, definitely recommend that you uh, have a read yourself. 
Uh, and and there, there's lots there, really accessible, that you could uh, take out and present to staff at various points. Um, it's all, it, you know, it brings in Hattie, it brings in growth mindset, all sorts of stuff. Things that, that we talk about in schools um, a, a lot. Um, what did we want to do with our assessment? We wanted to, or why do we want to focus on uh, what a student's ready to learn? Uh, and it comes down to that idea of targeted teaching. If you know, if a student knows where they are um, in precise ways on a range of skills, um, it's really, we can then, you know, uh, it sounds obvious, but it's a lot harder than it sounds, um, let them know where they need to go next. But also for us, we can gather the data that we need to target teaching in specific ways. Now, if you were like a lot of schools and like us a year ago, um, you, you'd have all sorts of different marking schemes and, and, and tools to do that. Um, so I guess I just want you to keep in mind identifying where the students ready to, what they're ready to learn next and what we need to teach them next or guide them through next. Um, we started with a review of our criteria sheets and, and marking schemes, and we were using a whole range of different things uh, between faculties, within faculties. Um, don't know how well you can see it, but the typical sort of a list of statements and then tick a box one to five, we had plenty of those. Um, we had some more advanced uh, rubrics that had descriptors on them. Um, and people were saying they're great. This is where they would, people sort of recognised the one to five, wasn't uh, the most innovative way to do it or the most useful way, but they were pretty comfortable with their rubrics, with their statements on them. Um, and thinking about how to get them to, I guess, interrogate or to question the, uh, the quality of those tools, uh, what we did was we went to different faculties, we pulled up a rubric from Year 7, a rubric from Year 9, a rubric from Year 10 for a similar task, and we put them side by side. And they said the same thing. And I'm thinking, in particular, Penny really dropped with our English department when we had a text response, a series of text response um, assessment sheets, and there was essentially and sometimes literally no difference between a Year 7 and a Year 10 um, criteria. Uh, they were essentially saying the same thing. They used vague terms like, um, you know, does this well, excellent, to a high degree, somewhat, or, you know, few errors, minimal errors, no errors, all this kind of stuff. Um, and you, when you put them side by side and you say, well, what, what's the learning progression here? And teachers went, oh, I know what it means. I know what it is. Uh, they didn't necessarily agree amongst themselves because they had slightly different ideas of what, they, what those differences were and the kids had no chance. So that was a really useful tool to open up the conversation with teachers to say, well, is this good enough? If we're going to track growth um, and report on growth, there's no way we can even start to talk about that or to do that until we have an instrument that actually allows us to have an accurate measure of growth. So that's where we started from. Um, there's a, lot, there's a lot of research out there on this too. And the guru, guru for us was uh, Patrick Griffin, who is out of Melbourne University. And if you have any students coming out of the, the Melbourne Uni Masters of Teaching uh, program, uh, they're, they're well versed in all this. And they're, I guess, I would say ahead of the game in terms of assessment. So we went to Patrick Griffin's work and his thing is about developmental rubrics about having learning progressions that, really, that are really clear and kind of precise in terms of what skills we're, uh, we're looking at and how they change and develop over time. So definitely recommend having a read of uh, his articles, but particularly this book was our Bible and some of the work that, um, that is in the, the packs on the tables is uh, from that book. So his argument is uh, our rubrics and our assessment tools should be developmental in nature, meaning they should be based on skills progression. In a perfect world, you'll be able to pick up your uh, state-mandated curriculum and see that progression really clearly stated. Um, but in our experience, it's not. Um, and that's the other thing. There was another thing we had to throw in for this year. We've moved to the Victorian curriculum for those Victorian schools here too. So we were already looking back at um, our curriculum and our assessment as well. One more thing. Um, they have to be evidence-based. Our judgments have to be evidence-based. Again, that sounds obvious. But when you really tie pe teachers down to making judgments on what kids, you know, the, the old phrase, they do say, make or write, rather than 
the teacher adding that up, you know, throwing their own inferences, which is hard to, to judge and be consistent. It's actually harder than it sounds. Um, but once you get there, you have a clearly articulated and consistent approach uh, that is transparent both to fellow teachers, to parents, and to the students themselves. And then finally, you can start to measure uh, the growth uh, that comes from those skills progressions. I heard someone use the term, I think it might have been you guys, uh, yesterday, the idea of a master rubric. That, that's right, yeah. That's where we started from um, in about May last year. We're going to produce, we're going to identify the skills that, um, that are in you know, our different faculty areas, and we're going to build a master rubric. We call them our I can statements um, across you know, before grade six all the way through to above year 10. Um, we devoted five meetings in a row. So five uh, uh, every week we had a meeting in faculty groups for an hour and a half. We thought we're going to break the back of this uh, in those five meetings. Um, that was in May. We're still working on them now, so <laughs> be prepared. It was. I'm glad we didn't know what we were getting ourselves in for at the start. We might not have gone down the path, but we needed to. Um, and so from Griffin, we get this model. And you will, know, you will recognise this from uh, Schoolbox itself. So obviously the guys at Schoolbox are on the Griffith bandwagon as well, um, and we're really impressed by that. We think that's great. Um, these aren't accidental or just there because they look pretty. It actually doesn't look pretty at all. It's, it's actually probably more com complex than, than, um, uh, than you would expect. Um, but it's, it, it refers to specific things here. So I'm going to talk about in a second. Uh, what a capability is, capability, what an indicator is, and we'll talk about descriptors um, in a minute uh, as well. Again, for a, a detailed, I'm going to skim over the top here, and I'll, I'll show you some examples on the tables, but for detailed explanation and a deep, deeper understanding, um, hire a Melbourne Uni graduate, it's probably a good place to start, and um, have a look at the book, because he goes into it uh, really well. So a capability is... A, um, a big skill. Um, and I'll, an example might be, I'll show some examples on the board here in a minute, but um, in science you might have, um, well, look, history is my subject, historical skills or historical reasoning might be uh, a, 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 a larger overarching skill. Um, the indicators are then how that skill breaks down into observable things. So let me bring you to some examples. Using the history example, historical skills um, could be broken down further into source selection, evaluating sources, analysing cause and effect. Some of these terms we took from um, the Victorian curriculum itself. <laughs> historical reasoning, on the other hand, how do you um, maybe even apply um, your, your analysis of the sources? How do you turn that into an argument? That's a different capability, capability a different um, category of skill. And that could be broken down into formulation of art. We broke it down into formulation of argument, synthesis of information. Um, they then become your skill progressions. Again, it seems when you see it presented like that, you go, okay, that makes sense. But you get five history teachers, let alone 10 or 20 history teachers in the room, and you do have to thrash that out. And that's just the way we've done it. You could do it. There are, there are other ways to cover, I guess, the same sort of principles. The argument or, or the, the lesson from us, I think, the lesson we've learned, is that as long as you, you agree and then you become consistent, that's probably the most powerful thing you can do. And that matters in school box as well. Because if you're using, although, let me go back a bit, your descriptors, those empty boxes there, they can come and go, they can change, depending on whether where in the master rubric um, you fit, you put your lens around. So it might be, you know, year eights would go sort of pre-year eight, post-year eight. Um, the descriptors are fine, but the, capa the capabilities and the indicators, the language there, if you get them consistent and right in school box, you can then track how they, um, how they track the data that they generate over time, over assessments. So you can actually, uh, it gives you a really powerful way to, to measure the growth, which we were aiming to do. Can I just see a show of hands? I should have done this at the start. How many people are using developmental rubrics at the moment? All right, we need to swap email addresses, definitely, because um, it's hard to do on your own. I'd love to see your examples too. Um, 
Who's thinking about it? Is, is someone, is anyone sort of familiar with the term and starting to explore? Okay. How many people are doing rubrics in Schoolbox? That's really interesting. So probably a, a, a minority of people who are thinking about developmental rubrics, but the vast majority of you using the format of the, of the system. So that's, um, I was just wondering how much of this maybe uh, you know, I'm speaking to people who you know, stick converted already. But um, yeah, when we get to the examples, maybe there's some thoughts there about how you might change the way you use rubrics um, at the moment in Schoolbox. Okay. So as you would know, that's what it looks like uh, in the end. Um, maybe before I move on, I just uh, jump up, jump around a bit. Um, have a look on your tables. There might, I don't think there's going to be enough for one for everyone. But on the last page, just in terms, just to give you a sense of why it, 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 it'll take you more than five meetings in a row to, to sort this out. On the last page, there's um, a list of rules. And it comes from that Griffin book. And it's where the rubber meets, hits the road, really. And this is where your teachers will get really annoyed with you. Um, it's actually just worth pausing. And I'll give you, give you a minute just to scan through. Um, these are Griffin's guidelines for um, writing proper descriptors, effective descriptors. And you can even just tick off <laughs> the ones that you think you do well and the ones that, that are going to be a challenge to, to implement. I'll give you a minute just to read through that list. And feel free to discuss them on your table as you go. I'll just throw it back on that. Um, so what you start to notice, um, I guess, the, um, what's the word? Really common things that we put into our rubrics suddenly become uh, questionable. You know, the things like numbers, that quality, qualitative language, that where you are making the inferences. How do you extract, subtract those kind of inferential statements um, and really get down to clearly, again, the challenge of what a kid you know, does, says, um, writes. It's pretty hard. And teachers will, will um, what's the word, adapt to, the, to it at, uh, to varying degrees of very speed. Um, and Clancy in a minute is going to talk about how we use Schoolbox and I guess that, that prompt of Schoolbox, a new system with you know, no old stuff in it, how we sort of leverage that to say um, we have to make this change. Okay, so for all the work and the heartache that, that we put into it, what are the benefits that we're seeing already and that we expect to see more of into the future? Um, definitely the idea of uh, clarity. Uh, 
in a way, it's good that the curriculum that's out there doesn't come pre-packaged like this because it forces your teachers to have the professional conversations around what they agree, what, what agreements they're making about what a skill is and how that progresses. That's something that you have to, that you should get your teachers to do, um, but also as, you, as, I guess, teachers shift around and new people come on board, I think it's a conversation we're going to have to continue to have um, with people you know, forever, but we've got, a, we've got a, a basis for it now. So uh, enforcing that clarity, having the idea of a skills progression is actually more uh, revolutionary is probably too ter uh, strong a term, but a further away from current practice than, 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 than most people would realise. And probably outside of education, they'd go, don't you do that already? And you think, actually, some ways we do, but other ways we don't. Um, it's allowed us to start to focus on growth. Uh, that will become, as we refine these assessment tools and they become more reliable, that's something that now we can, we can look at 2018 and build dashboards and all sorts of things because we have data that we feel is valid. Um, as a teaching tool to take the rubric into class and to pull it apart and get kids to annotate it and truly understand it um, is, again, the evidence tells us, and we're seeing that in our, in our own experience, a really powerful thing. To have kids go in and see consistent language from task to task and year level to year level is going for us, I think, as our kids become aware that what we did in Year 7 English on a text response essay, to use that example, doesn't just stop after that essay. It moves, it follows those skills are developed in other tasks and they're developed across their experience um, at school. So they will become more familiar with the actual um, skills progressions themselves. And just in terms of you know, having that consistency of judgment, we're seeing in our moderation processes uh, a great, uh, 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 a lot more consistency already. What does it do in school box? Um, I'm glad James is in the room because I'm going to pull up another slide which I have a question about and I want to know the answer. Um, we are starting with our heads of department to use, um, to use the analytics to pull apart you know, where our, our students are, which skills our students are uh, developing more than others. We've actually just got access to the database. Um, so we, can, we now have in the CSV, Clancy will talk about this more from a technical point of view, um, uh, all the data in real time that uh, is entered in terms of the rubrics, we're extracting that. Um, we can extract that at any point and we can do our own uh, analysis of that too. So we're actually now building a whole new meeting structure next year with professional learning teams around the data that these are generating which we couldn't do, if we had built PLTs last year, um, they would have stagnated. Now we've got the data and the tools for them to use, um, and that's where we're shifting, that's part of our next steps. Getting the language and, and getting teachers to when they create the tasks to use uh, the consistent language in the descriptors and the capabilities means that that data, uh, in, when it gets to this stage, is um, much more powerful. And Clancy will talk a little bit about that too. This one. This one we presented to staff once we moved to Schoolbox. Um, I don't know, I can't even remember where we got it from now. Um, we really want this. <laughs> Am I missing it or is it not there yet? That's right. Um, so, yes, we want that. Um, that's our aspiration as well. Um, but we need everyone to you know, bring, bring along the progressive rubric and practice because it's the perspective that we want. Uh, so, the challenge is back on us then. I like that. <laughs> um, but imagine the effect. Imagine the, the interview with the parent where you can say, you know, these skills that we've developed over five assessment tasks this year and how they've tracked. Again, you need that um, master rubric, that master progression underneath to be able for this to make any sense. But once we're there, that's going to be a really powerful tool for us. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Clancy to talk about, um, I guess, the issues we faced along the way. Uh, 
So you might have gathered um, from what Daniel said so far, we had this um, really big project in terms of our developmental rubrics and writing I can statements in faculties um, and really changing the landscape of how we assess um, in year seven to 10 across the whole school. And to feed into that, we had this other enormous project, which was going to be uh, reviewing our LMS and then selecting a new one to implement for the start of 2017. And what we needed to do in order to be successful in both is be really transparent with our staff as to where it was all going um, and how, I guess, the LMS project wasn't going to be anything too different to um, the curriculum redesign, say, in Year 7 to 10, um, that they were really going to complement each other. Um, and we stuck true to that and we had, you know, criteria and selection um, that we were looking for when we were finding a new LMS and we simply had to go with something that was going to be as user friendly as possible for our teachers when they started building these rubrics. So we're wrapped that, you know, we've gone down the school box path um, and over time we just think it's going to get easier and easier for our teachers um, when they're not only building rubrics but then when they start just refining and reviewing um, and marking them on their on their devices. But we've, we've had to really sort of make sure we are transparent with what the benefits are because teachers and, you know, customers, I guess, in general, always want to know what's in it for them. So we were, we were quite mindful of making sure that the benefits um, were clear for people to see throughout the journey. Um, and that's been consistent sort of all the way through. With our, um, with our guidelines in terms of what we wanted teachers to do with um, rubrics, we start off with the goal, and, and we've got that goal for the whole year, is having one assessment per term in every year seven to 10 subject that has a developmental rubric attached to it. Um, so that's built in Schoolbox. So for term one, um, and this sort of started probably in term four last year, um, people started working on that rubric, um, getting it ready for term one. So I think it might have been due at the end of last year. You almost teachers had to have their, their one rubric ready for year seven science. What's the assessment going to be in term one? that's going to have a developmental rubric attached to it. Um, and that allowed us to have an element of quality control. I guess they were, they were submitted in. And we, we looked over them and made sure that we had the numbers in the right spots, the descriptors in the right spots, the ICANN statements matched um, you know, the language in the rubric um, so that you know, we had a level of consistency throughout each department. Um, and what's happened over time is we sort of said, well, what, what we expect to happen is if we develop a rubric for a task in term one, one in term two, one in term three, one in term four, depending on if you're teaching a year-based subject or a semester-based subject, you'll be able to use those rubrics again, um, either the following semester or the following year, and you might just do a review, a critique, you might make some small changes, um, and then you know, just you know, attach that rubric to the task again if you want to. Um, what we've probably found in selling that benefit is we've realised as our understanding and our skill levels have improved with developmental rubrics along the journey, we sort of got to term two and we looked back at term one and thought they're probably not as good as they could have been. Um, and they might have been made back at the end of 2016. And, and you can look at that as a glass half empty or glass half full sort of approach. Um, but we see that as a positive in that our staff are getting better and better at, at developing these rubrics. So for this year, as Daniel mentioned, we've got access to our rubric data and we're sort of experimenting with a few different queries in our, um, our Schoolbox database. But uh, we're hoping that throughout this year we start looking at the data, um, but we're not sort of being too critical as to what's coming out in those reports because we believe that 2018 is probably going to be our first year where we've got, uh, we can start to get some meaningful data around our rubrics because the quality will have improved so much from this year to next year. Um, so that's sort of where we're at with that. Um, definitely has been, as Daniel mentioned a couple of times, um, a lot more challenging than we initially realised. And my, in my role, I guess, I work with teachers a lot when we're either implementing something new or teachers need to be, um, need some assistance in, in building their skills with new software. Um, and quite often that can be I, I can be a middle person in between the teachers and our IT support staff. Um, and when it comes to things like Schoolbox, they'll typically come to me first. Um, 
although we're, you know, we're building a knowledge base amongst our staff, which is you know, improving all the time, which is nice. We're sort of sharing the load. But the main things that I'd sort of thought I'd flag are the things that teachers have come to me with. And then that's sort of where rubrics um, can be a little bit tricky. So if we're in the year seven science team, for example, and we're creating a, a new due work item on the unit page, and we want all of the year seven science uh, teachers to import that task to their class page. So 7A needs the task, 7B, 7C, and so on. Um, what can happen is, um, you know, there might be one teacher responsible for that rubric, you know, they're, they're working on it, and then a teacher thinks, oh gee, you know, that's coming up soon, I better import that. Um, and then later on, the following day, the following week, teacher makes some more changes to that rubric. Uh, when it comes time to assess, that teacher that imported it a little bit too early is not marking off the latest version of the rubric. And all of a sudden you've got an inconsistency between what that teacher is assessing their students on and what the other teachers are assessing. So it's really important that you have sort of a, a system in place whereby you might have one person in the year seven science team responsible for the rubric. And when that rubric is absolutely finalized, they either push it out to all the class pages or they notify the other teachers that they can then import that task and it's ready to go. And, and then I guess the other element is, as a team, you've got to commit to that rubric um, and not go and make any other changes to it yourselves. So um, what can be a little bit confronting with the way our rubrics are now designed is that um, if you're at standard for everything that you should be doing, you're probably going to be getting sevens out of 10. So if, if you hit at standard for absolutely everything, that's going to get you an end score as a percentage of 70. And you need to have that dialogue, and, and we've needed to do that with our classes and with our parents, as to well, what does 70% now represent, as opposed to what it's represented in the past. Um, so there's new interpretation, and with that just um, comes more communication with students and parents and teachers as to how to interpret these scores from a rubric. But the great thing about these developmental rubrics is you can quite clearly see how that 70% came to fruition. Where, where did I hit in each of these indicators or each of these benchmarks? What's the next stage of my learning and what have I already achieved? So hopefully that 70%, while it might be a little bit confronting initially that a student who's doing everything at the expected level is only getting 70 perhaps, um, you can quite clearly see where they're at with their learning progression. So it's hopefully more transparent as to how that score was achieved rather than just an ambiguous 70%. that 70 percent and I can't remember the study but it's sort of like become folklore but where they um we'd like if we could get rid of the grades we would to be honest they get in the way and um what was the research it said you know you, you give the kids um the comment just the comment you give them the comments and the grade you give them just the grade and the, uh, the study found that the kids who just received the grades made you know 50 percent progress the kids that received just the comment made 75 percent growth I should say so made more growth, significantly more growth. The kids that received the grade and the comment made the same level of progress as the kids who just received the grade. So it was the grade itself that was the limiting factor. Um, if we could get rid of the grades, we could have way more things in our rubrics to give those kids at either end um, you know, chances to show their progression. But it would just skew, so the, uh, skew the marks. Uh, if we added two more levels at the bottom, which we know our classrooms have, um, it means yeah, it would just throw everything out. So we made a compromise and said 70% was at the standard. Um, but that was through, as Clancy said, um, some discussion. Um, just also one point about how we've... So we report on one rubric per subject per term. Um, and we used Tim's advice for last, last year, I think he presented, um, saying with going to continuous reporting, you know, just get a minimal comment, two, two or three lines, um, for the assessment task, which is what we've said. Our idea is, and this is how we solve continuous reporting, put, put all your work into the rubric, that'll do the heavy lifting. You'll only have to write a couple of comments underneath, really, and that'll be rich feedback. Um, but other assessment tasks, there might be three assessment tasks that turn. What we've said is, that just gets a percentage grade. We haven't even said put a comment in as well. We'll move, that'll change as people become more familiar. So a kid at the end of the term might have three percentage grades, one of them will have the rubric and the comment attached as well, just as a way of managing the change. Um, next steps for us. Uh, again, that continuous uh, cycle of, of reviewing and improving them. 
uh, and building our own understanding. Um, for us, we're just embarked on that extraction and what we can do with the data and how we can mix and match it in a way that will allow us to build a PLT system uh, next year where it'll be around targeted teaching using evidence and feedback to inform that. Um, and we'll move beyond the one rubric. We've already had teachers you know, coming up. Why, why are you saying I can only use one rubric when I, you know, I want to use two or three? And it's really just that consistency and you know, stopping parents from all the other subjects going, but that teacher's doing way better. It's like, okay, we'll get there. Um, but that's, that's something that we'll roll out. Um, another next step for us, um, we'd love to be in touch with schools that are doing the same thing, going down that, this road, because we've kind of done it on our own. Um, we've heard bits and pieces, you know, on the grapevine. Kind of, you know, it hasn't been in a systematic way in terms of a community of practice around this, and we'd love to do that. Um, so when you read out, if, when you go through the ones we've given you, rip them apart. Like, they're, we're not saying that they're perfect by any means, but we'd love to, to learn from as many people as possible. Um, and I think that, yeah, we're done. Yeah, good luck. Um, does anyone have any questions for Daniel or Clancy while we're up here? One of the things we'd love is to be able to mark the same rubric twice. So to have, um, let's say you're doing a unit, I'll use the text response essay because it's in my head, um, the practice essay and then the, the um, final product on the same rubric so they could physically see, um, again, thinking ahead to imagine we didn't have the numbers and the kids, or the kids didn't care about the numbers, they could see the change they made on that, that one rubric. Or even better, you know, if we had our master rubrics underneath, and I'm taking that term and running with it now, I'm going to, they're master rubrics now, um, to be able to, from assessment task to assessment task, just, again, that graph would do it too, but to be able to have more than one mark on a rubric, I'm not sure how hard that would be, but that would, we would, we would embrace that. But question, Jess. It might be a no-brainer, but I'm just wanting to understand the nature of the header row on the rubric. Is that a reference to year stage level? What's the reference to? Yeah, um, the Victorian curriculum sort of um, points, progression points. Yeah, so good question. So the one in the middle, that'll represent at standard. So if it says eight in Victoria, that's the end of year seven. So that would be a set. Uh, that's, it's the year level progression. It's the year level sort of progressions. The mark, that'll change from year to year, which depending on which year level. The numbers underneath, They'll always be the same. So it's, I think it's 5.5, 5, 4, 5.5, 5, 7, 8.5, and 10. No matter what year level, that column in the middle will always be a 7. Because if you went all the way down that column, you'd be at standard and you'd end up with 70%. Sorry, two questions. Um, you've got marks underneath, so for example, writing and How did you get to that rating for the 4, the 5.5, 5, 7, the 8.5? Yeah. Um, they're in the boxes, just because I've cut and pasted it straight from school box. Um, they match the columns up the top. So, yeah, um, that was a school decision. We wanted to say, what would the spread look like if you're at standard, above, below, significantly above, below? Do you have an answer to that? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm in the maths department, but, <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I guess I, I've only got year 12s at the moment, so I didn't have to do a rubric um, at, at the, <laughs> yet. yet. Um, I guess the conversations that we had, though, as a faculty were just around our skill progression, like the, when we wrote the I can statements, um, like, and that was the very beginning of it, essentially was, you know, if, if a student's at grade or year seven level in number and algebra, you know, what are the different skills that they're going to demonstrate? Um, and then we just tried to work up from there and go seven, 7.5, 8, 8.5, and not every unit went from seven to 10, because, you know, some areas of maths come in at year eight or come in at year nine, like trig might come in at year nine. So you only started, you, you know, you trig comments there. Um, 
But we, once we'd done that, and that was the real heavy lifting, it was very easy to bring those statements across to a rubric because if it was a year eight task, you've got your descriptors effectively for seven, 7.5, eight, 8.5, nine. Um, and they might not all be populated depending on the skill that you put in, uh, which is probably something that, uh, like we, I think the examples that you've got, they're, they're all populated. Uh, but there certainly are certain skills that don't start where you might need them to. So you can leave them blank or they might not go as high as you need them to. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I, I guess the heavy lifting was in writing the statements that map out the skill progression. And once we'd done that, as to the best of our ability, and that took a fair while, um, and, we, and there was a lot of reviewing of that and cutting it down because there was so much that you could possibly write. Um, once we'd done that, the transfer to the rubrics was, I guess, the easier part, yeah. Um, and the type of tasks that you do, assessment tasks that you do, we wanted to change them before any of this, but this has prompted, I guess, um, a real rethink about what counts as assessment. So the, the department have produced rich tasks, we call them. Um, some are richer than others at the moment, but they're getting there. Um, but it has been, that has been quite tricky. Um, just another point, Clancy mentioned he teaches U12 and so he hasn't had to make any rubrics. Uh, one of the things we did do was not touch VCE. We wanted to get it right first. We didn't want to you know, scare people too much. Um, so we've year 11, year 12, we haven't gone down this path. And unfortunately the, v the VCAA rubrics don't follow any of the rules that are on the sheet. Um, so there's work to be done and they can be made better. If you want to see examples, another, another good source at Melbourne Uni, um, uh, related, it's called reliablerubrics.com um, and it's uh, a project that they've put together with their grad students. Um, I don't know if they're still updating it, but it's got a couple of years worth of, um, of rubrics in different subjects. Um, and again, they're just, they're raw, they're as they were produced by those students, but they'll give you some, something to work with. Yes, yeah. What if you've got a year nine student, this is the rubric for their task, they're hitting 10, first, first task in year nine, mm -hmm. what, how then are you, are you assigning them additional tasks, are you extending them, what are you doing so that a student doesn't go, oh well, I'm in year nine and I'm, I'm at year 10 level, I'll check out now. Yep, um, my question back would be, what are you doing in your classrooms now? So you do. Um, we, haven't got, we haven't got to the point where we've got additional rubrics, um, but in terms of produ uh, giving them differentiated work, that's, that's what we're doing, yeah. Um, again, to varying degrees, yeah. but now the pressure is greater than it has been to do that, because we are, we're, we're getting, and the whole purpose of these is to accelerate learning as well, so that every kid learns quicker. So they're going to tap out as, as we use these more and more, um, more quickly. So the pressure on, is on us to produce learning, you know, experiences that will cater for that. And we're not completely there yet, not at all. Yeah. Just, just with that, sorry. It should be harder now, I guess, for that year nine student who's working at year 10 level, it should be harder with this rubric to get 100% than it was previously. Because previously, I guess, they were probably just being assessed at year nine level and they would have got that 100% just for being at year nine level, let alone year 10. So now we're hoping that those students that are at the expected level or you know maybe six months ahead can see that there's a lot more scope to improve because our developmental rubric's mapping until 12 months ahead. Um, but yeah, like the question's still really valid about what's a student doing who's still 12 months ahead. Um, we've found maths pathways really useful um, in that that does like diagnostic tests test for students to see where they're at and then gives them individual work to go on with outside of those rich tasks that Daniel mentioned. Um, so, you know, that's been good as well. We've also published um, the master rubrics on all our course pages um, so that a Year 7 student can see where it's heading all the way through. Um, by no means have we got a culture of our students where they would check that or even know that for most of them, but that's, what we, that's something we need to definitely address. We have gone slash going through the process of putting rubrics together for your school. A um, couple of questions. First of all, how did you get um, the faculty to agree on your capability to indicate? So we've had a bit of a little bump fight over that one. 
Um, there's no one answer to that because they did it all very differently and some were harder than others. Um, I'm not sure if this will answer your question, but the process we began with, we actually, because it was Victorian curriculum was coming in, we immersed them in that, got them to um, draw out language from there. But then, you know, I think a really a, a useful activity, again, I don't know if it's going to answer your question, is to get your teachers in a, in, around a table, lots of sticky notes, and say, for this particular type of skill, let's say you know, oral presentation, for example, is an easy one, um, what are all the different elements of oral presentations that we would look for? And get them just to write down, one statement per, per note, um, as many things as they can think of. And you, you've got to throw out half pretty much straight away, or they've got to double up. And then you start to categorise them. What are the, the skill areas that seem that are that have become obvious from that? And then you can start to then use them to, to transplant out and create the progressions. Um, at the end of the day, it was it was a, a series of negotiations, and that idea that you know what, there's no one exact right way to do it. You just got to agree. And I, and I assume that like, when they're coming to the idea of the elements of a particular task, they were. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it was actually quite handy having the Victorian curriculum there as a, as a sort of a punching bag. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so I mean, it's pretty obvious that this is really a popular topic. These guys are supposed to speak for 25 minutes and they've been up here for almost double that. Um, so I really, I really do appreciate that Daniel um, and Clancy have come and shared their experience with continuous reporting. And if we could put our hands together, and I've got to look this one.